Today I'm uh, going to present my PhD project and parts of my source material and uh, uh, hopefully give you an example of negotiated social identity and social practice uh, in an urban environment. And I want to stress that in Scandinavia, medieval period um, extends from around 1050 to the early 15th, uh, 1500s. And when you are talking about early medieval, we have Vendel and Viking Age period in Scandinavia. Yeah, uh, and during the past two decades, urban archaeology in Scandinavia has changed. Up until the 60s and early 70s, medieval urban research was mainly a uh, historical subject in Sweden. Due to large-scale excavations within several medieval towns during the 60s, 70s and 80s, urban archaeology grew and became a research field to be reckoned with. Uh, several researchers aimed to describe the urbanization process from a regional and international viewpoint. The medieval town was viewed from the top down as the sum of its institutions and structures, a monument often described from functionalistic and economic, productive and political viewpoints, totally lacking individuals and people. Urban archaeological research inherited these historical approaches towards urban research, and thus archaeological research partly missed out on issues better suited to discuss based on material culture. Since the mid-90s, the research uh, has turned towards a wider regional and international time-space uh, perspective and issues regarding everyday life, the individual, identity and gender are increasingly discussed. To uh, greater consent, multidisciplinary approaches, for example, for example, archaeobotanical, osteo osteological, historical and anthropological approaches are undertaken. The challenge is to consider the spe specific historical development of a town and at the same time explain similarities and differences between different places. This is a brief summary and in no way complete uh, and there are of course a lot of nuances uh, to consider. But in short, one could say that the research interests have changed from a top-down perspective uh, with the king and central power in focus towards a bottom-up perspective where the actions and practices of ordinary people also are considered. In my own research, I'm focusing on everyday life and the ordinary people, seldom visible in the historical record. I want to discuss how the ordinary people and everyday life participated in developing a small town like uh, Nishaping to become a medieval <coughs> urban community with different functions and activities and uh, diversity of inhabitants and uh, visitors and how that changed over time. To be able to analyze, understa understand and highlight ordinary life and actors in the medieval town, I'm working with social practice theory and social identity as analytical tools. And as I understand it, social practice theory is engaged in explaining how different patterns of practice become established and shared within a community. It can also be used in explaining how and why certain practices change and perhaps disappear to be replaced by other practices. In a paper from 2014, Professor Axel Christoffersen examined the potential of recent social practice theory as a possible analytical tool in an urban archaeological approach to medieval urban communities. He suggested we should approach the medieval towns as a social space of practice that developed through the performing, performativity that bounds practices together through countless actions and events. In doing so, you get a new repertoire of questions and other sources are activated. The collected data can also be used in new contexts. This approach fits well uh, with the intentions of my research and I believe that it's in the repetitive remains of everyday life that the key to understanding the urban way of life is to be traced. To broaden the view of urban medieval life and actually peopling the towns, I'm also interested in analyzing how social identity can be traced in Nishaping. 
since, since it's the ordinary people who are in focus, the categories concerns class, gender, age, ethnicity and religious manifestations. During the last decades, the identity categories have broadened considerably. Uh, for example, age is represented uh, by the archaeology of children, um, and that's one category more recently considered. Age is important in many ways, as we are not born with our identities complete. These can be both created over time and altered during our life cycle. We are still lacking case studies regarding social identity in Scandinavian urban environments, and we are still in the early stages of research regarding these issues. I'm uh, aware of the pitfalls and discussions in regards to the archaeology of identities, and the identities are not static, but rather actively constructed. They are complex dynamics and mixed constructions. Material culture is considered emblematic of identities, but one should be aware to simplify what are complex processes of identity manif <coughs> manifestations and interrelations. As I see it, the people in the early, early medieval towns had an opportunity to nego negotiate not only the urban lifestyle, but also they could use the new setting as the town must have been uh, to negotiate alternative social identities. I will return to this issue in a moment. The qualitative analysis in my research are based on source material from two large-scale excavations in Nyköping, completed in 2010 and 2011. And Nyköping is situated approximately 100 kilometers south of Stockholm, by the Baltic Sea in the county of Sörmland. During the medieval period, there were six towns in the county marked on the map to the left, the town has been characterized as an administrative center within the county and appears in the written record as an, as an important meeting place. Uh, the written sources from the early and high middle period are uh, rather scarce though. Uh, this is the oldest map of Nyköping, drawn some, sometime uh, around 1650. And on, that, uh, on the map you see the old town plan and the new regulated town plan. The circle, if you can see it, yeah. <laughs> well, um, it marks the location of the uh, uh, excavations and uh, it's placed in the central of the town near the river. The map also shows two uh, churches. Um, St. Nikolai on the west side of the river and all saints, saints on the east side and the star marks the location of the friar convent. The convent was founded in the 1280s and both churches are considered being built up in the early 13th century. Uh, in the south on the west side of the uh, is the royal castle also built in the 13th century. Uh, prior to the castle at the same location there was a keep probably built in the 12th century, and recent archaeological excavations have confirmed an early 12th century dating of the keep. The presence of the king in Nyköping is supported by written sources, mainly from the 14th century, by documents signed by the king. The earliest mentioning of Nyköping is from 1250, when the Queen Katharina donates all her possessions in Nyköping <coughs> to the convent in Gudhem. Thus, the written records underline the interest of the central power in uh, Nyköping during the medieval period. Uh, the town also had two squares, one in front of the St. Nikolai church and the council square, which is located right in the excavation area. And this is an aerial photo of the site. and. Uh, as you can see, the excavations were close to the river with an estuary in a bay of the Baltic Sea. The location were thus good for fishing, shipping, trade and marketing. The excavations in Åkrokken were completed with a strict single context method, which is not always considered in Sweden, unfortunately, and with an outspoken environmental approach. Uh, we had a quaternary geologist, archaeobotanist, osteologist, and archaeological conservator on site. And I cannot stress the advantages of working closely with multidisciplinary experts during fieldwork, 
it really does add value to the interpreted source material created. We have recorded about 4,000 individual contexts and about 26,000 single artifacts. And we've been able to separate 14 settlement phases dated through 126 dendrochronological analysis and 12 radiocarbon datings. Most phases contained, uh, contains a timeline of 15 to 20 years and we have identified more than 80 houses, streets, passages, plots, plot boundaries and other structures. All in all, part of seven plots have been excavated. And the oldest settlement uh, phase stems from the mid 7th century when uh, two large scale boathouses were established by the water. They were 30 meters long and 10 meters wide and large enough to harbor ships of the size of the Norwegian Osebær uh, ship. The boathouses have been in use for a long period and through careful stratigraphical analysis of the abandonment phase we have been able to establish that to the mid 11th century. Both houses of this size is um, unknown in Sweden, but uh, similar buildings have been recorded in Norway. We have interpreted these um, both houses as part of an older version of the, the naval organization. The oldest town plan was regulated in the late 11th century. And as you can see at this time, uh, there were only four plots and the plots were quite wide up to 15 meters. Plot number five and six uh, were during this phase separated by a narrow alley leading down to the water. The whole town plan was structured with elongated plots facing the river in the south and a narrow wooden paved street in the north. And only 20 years later we have a more dense settlement with six different plots. Around the year 1200, 12, 1200, the structure of the town plan is uh, still similar. The main difference is that plot, plot number six has been divided into two with a wooden paved alley as a plot boundary. A similar wooden paved alley is found in, the, uh, in between plot number one and two in the northeast corner. Yeah. And in the southern parts of plot number seven, uh, a small boathouse was uh, recorded. And uh, this picture shows plot number one with the house to the left and a fallen wooden fence to the right, used as a uh, used as a, a part of a wooden paved street. Well, some uh, time in the second half of the 13th century, a rather massive landslide occurred in the slope facing the river. This could be documented by our quaternary geologists. The northern parts of the plots were vacated in favor of a square identified in the later written records as the council square. Unfortunately, very few traces of the square were preserved, mostly secondary fillings. The southern parts of the plots remained in use and uh, Actually, these are the first manifest, manifest structures preserved from this part of the excavated area. The older structures were demolished in the landslide and the whole southern part was rebuilt. During this period, the castle was built. Uh, the Franciscan convent is founded in New Shopping and the 13th century have been considered the main urbanization period in central eastern Sweden. And even though the town have existed for about 150 50 years, this period can be considered a breaking point in the town's <coughs> development. This was a period of change of practice and perhaps a, uh, a time where the urban lifestyle was renegotiated. Ah, and this picture shows the new buildings in the southern parts of uh, niche, uh, the excavation facing the river. They are interpreted as economy buildings, they lack fireplace and the artifacts, artifacts found within them couldn't be linked to the average, uh, average household. The buildings during the medieval period were almost exclusively built uh, of wood, but in the beginning of the 14th century another feature is noticeable. The floors in the buildings are more often stone paved. This is also the case with the street in the northern parts of Åkroken, or the excavation area, uh, who from the early part of the 14th century also is coated with the stone paving. 
sometime during the late 15th, early 16th century, there's another breaking point in the practice of building houses, and probably also in the way plot, the plots are structured. Uh, stone cellars are erected, and possibly whole houses are built in stone. Not all of, uh, not all of them, but some of them are. The plots are structured with house, houses built around a centered courtyard. And as I mentioned, we found uh, 26,000 singular artifacts on the site. The most common artifact was uh, pottery, of course, consisting of blackware and Baltic ware, uh, probably uh, mostly homemade. Redware pottery imported from Denmark, Germany and the Baltic area. Almost stoneware and stoneware uh, imported from Germany. And even though the amount of sherds may seem big, the ceramic analysis have shown that on average one new item was registered every five to seven years. Um, and that indicates that the pottery was not for sale, not used as container for other goods like wine or oil. Rather, the pots were part of the tableware and something that the townspeople probably took good care of. Yeah, among other um, numerous kinds of categories of artifacts are bone and antler, um, leather items, wood, copper alloy, and iron items, of course. Uh, waste and debris from handicraft of different kind were also found in all plots, uh, though most of it was found in secondary fillings and thereby not able to connect with specific wor workshops. It seems like the handicraft was not specified in these parts of the shopping. Yeah, and there's a small collection of religious items and uh, um, different kinds of botanical remains, but I think I'm gonna skip that and try to <laughs> get to this. I will end this presentation with an example of how I believe I can move forward in researching uh, this material, aiming for a broader view on medieval urban life. Uh, I got the inspiration for this example in an article from 2011 by Gitta Hansen, who is working with early medieval Bergen in Norway. She has been working with so sausage pins, a fairly common find in the urban space. Um, we also found a few in Åkroken. Sausage pins were used in food production and therefore, according to Gitta, overlooked as a source material, since food production was a domestic activity carried out by persons representing the lower levels of society and therefore inherently less interesting for the big question uh, led by the mainstream research. She uh, has shown that food production in connection to these sausage pins and innkeeping emerged soon after the foundation of Bergen in the 11th century. Preparing food, handling mill and milk processing and brewing beer was traditionally a female task in the Scandinavian early medieval society. Uh, and these processes uh, are always connected to women in the written and iconographical docu uh, documents. And since Hansen has been able to show that the sausage, sausage making in Bergen in the early 12th century made a surplus, she proposes that some women, uh, when entering a new setting, the town, transformed a traditional rural female task, cooking and brewing, into a professional trade, selling food and drink to visitors in the town. And she makes a very good case and also draws upon a previously disregarded source. In my example, uh, I want to draw attention to the phenomenon of separated or detached fireplaces. Um, in Åkrok, uh, in Nyköping, we, uh, most fireplaces were found inside houses, mainly interpreted as dwelling houses. And this is uh, phase six, the second half of the 12th century. A number of separated fireplaces were documented within plot number five. This was also documented, documented <laughs> in the same area in the following phase uh, seven. Uh, when comparing the botanical finds in the fire fireplaces inside the dwelling houses with the finds in the detached fireplaces, one notices that there are a slight but distinct difference. The indoor fireplaces present a more um, 
distinct food preparing of animal products, whereas the detached fireplaces mainly seems to be used for brewing beer and to some extent preparing fish. The same can be noticed in uh, phase number, uh, number seven. Maybe this could be interpreted uh, in a similar way as Hansen has made in Bergen, as traces of professional women brewing and selling beer in the 12th century New Shopping. Uh, it's also interesting to notice that the years uh, before the landslide and the, the vacating of the plots um, to make place for the square, within the same plot, number five, there are several fireplaces. They are not detached, they are inside houses. Um, um, but th these houses have been uh, interpreted as possibly possible public bakeries. And perhaps it's stretching it a bit uh, far to suggest that uh, they too have been run and managed by professional women. But the bakery suggests a continuity of pro professional trade in food products within the same plot. And I think I'm gonna... <laughs>